Hello and welcome to the Chacha Wakabada Basset Creek Oral History Podcast, where our guests discuss ways that they and other indigenous peoples have lived, worked, and played in the Chacha Wakabada watershed for thousands of years. This project was created in Minnesota Makoche, or Minnesota, the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. The project was co-led by Dr. Casey Keeler and Crystal Boyd with support from community partners. More information is included at the end of this episode. On behalf of everyone who contributed to this project, thank you for tuning in. Please be aware that this interview includes content about sexual abuse. Good afternoon. I am here today with Ben Blackhawk for the Haha ha Wakpadan Bassett Creek Oral History Project. Thank you for joining me today, Ben. Good to be here. My uh, Indian name, Wojina Jinga, means standing thunder. So that would be Wojina Jinga. And it means uh, to strike and to stand. Naji means to stand in the Winnebago language. So, so my dad called me standing thunder. I'm a member of the Thunder Clan of the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, the student that I'm working with on transcriptions, um, she's non-native herself, but she is getting her PhD here at Wisconsin, and she is a linguist who studies the Ho-Chunk oh, language. Excellent. So she works very closely with the Ho-Chunk tribe of Wisconsin. So she'll be like, hmm, let's, let's make sure this is correct. So when you get the transcriptions, <laughs> you'll be able to approve that as well and catch any spelling errors as well. The orthography differs a little bit between Nebraska and Wisconsin, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure okay with does. Wisconsin orthography. <laughs> um, I've been learning lots about the orthography, particularly for folks who are Dakota. Um, ah. And I was like, you know, is it worth it to pay a, a, a Dakota language speaker? And then I was like, no, because there's so many different preferences based on generation or tribal affiliation mm -hmm. yes so i'm just kind of letting folks if they want to offer translations for any um, indigenous words or names kind of letting them do it themselves but it isn't expected yeah so to begin um, when and for how long have you lived or worked in this area surrounding bassett creek so my family moved here in 1970. My dad, Barry Blackhawk, was a teacher. Uh, we, his, he graduated, after he graduated from Mankato State University, he taught for a couple of years in Renville, Minnesota, uh, but then got a job in the Minneapolis Public Schools. And so we moved here to Crystal. Uh, and like I said, in 1970, um, and uh, I, for the time I went to college, I was, I, I, I lived in Northfield. Uh, I went to St. Olaf College, but then kind of moved back to this area once I had graduated and started working as a teacher myself uh, in the Minneapolis public schools and then later at a couple of different private schools. Um, so uh, I raised my own kids in this area as well. So what brought your family to this area in the 1970s? And then why did you return later as an adult? So um, my dad, uh, working at Minneapolis Public Schools, uh, was looking for a, a, a house. You know, I think we lived in White Bear Lake for six months. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the reason for that was my mom who was non-native, she's German and Norwegian. Her, um, her sister lived in um, White Bear Lake. And so we uh, had relatives there and, and uh, they were able to help us find a place. But, uh, but after a while, I'm not really sure why, because I was only eight years old at the time, we, uh, we moved to Crystal and um, lived in a house uh, right off Broadway uh, in the northern part of Crystal, kind of where Broadway meets uh, Bass Lake Road. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was work that brought us here. At first, my dad 
uh, working as a teacher. He taught English and Phi Ed and um, was the advisor for uh, uh, Indian Upward Bound. And um, uh, I think it was called something different then too. There was other names for uh, the Indians at South High. Uh, so in, uh, in Minneapolis. So he did uh, a lot to grow that group and, and, and bring them along. So that's, that's what brought us here. And then after, um, after college, I married uh, a gal that I met in, at, in high school here. I met at Cooper High School in New Hope. And, and so we moved. My mom was still living here and her, her parents lived in New Hope just five blocks from here. And we're still in this, the same house that we've been in since 1988. We're, we're thinking about moving, but we're still here for now. And you're in Crystal now. Still. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Yep. Like um, just five blocks from where I grew up. Wow. My husband and I, when we lived in Crystal, we lived um, basically one block in from Robbinsdale, right by that Welcome Park. Oh, yeah. So we were off, also off of County Road, um, 81 and kind of 42nd, right off of Broadway. Sure. So... I feel like living in this area in the 1970s and your dad working in Minneapolis at South High School, you were probably witness to a lot of American Indian activism as well. Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, we were, we, uh, we had cousins and other relatives who were much more involved, you know. Um, they were at Wounded Knee, for example. Mm -hmm. um, pretty sure my mom was pretty glad we weren't there to witness that <laughs> the uh the the you know occupation and so on and the standoff and uh so yeah my dad was definitely a part of American Indian movement and you know was friends with all the leaders and so on and and uh, they I I'm not sure but I think they sometimes had meetings at our house and you know, uh, I don't think we were allowed to be in the room, but <laughs> I don't I don't know that that for sure that that happened. Maybe they just were gatherings of friends he had over. But uh, but yeah, um, until my um, my family kind of split up, though, when I was 10 years old uh, in 1972. And um, but we still saw my dad a lot because he still lived in the area. He would mm -hmm. kind of uh, move back and forth between reservation in Winnebago, Nebraska, and um, different homes he had here in the Minneapolis area because mm -hmm. he taught, he's taught, still taught in Minneapolis public schools for several more years and, um, and worked in education pretty much all his life. So, okay. Wow. So you said you went to Cooper High School. That's right. Um, when you were a student, were th was there any Indian education programming that you were aware of? Not that I was aware of. Um, I was more interested in uh, music and theater. And so my mom, because my mom worked for Indian education uh, in Minneapolis Public Schools. Okay. Um, for many years, she, she was a secretary and an administrative assistant in that office run by Rosemary Christensen. And uh, she, uh, but they also had a friend from where they grew up. My mom and dad met in Albert Lee, Minnesota. Okay. Where my dad went to high school in Albert Lee and they, they got married there. And uh, a couple of us, uh, my older brother, Brad, and I were both born there. And, um, and so uh, they knew a guy named Wally Kennedy from, from uh, Albert Lee. And he, he later started the urban arts program. And so I, I was able to, uh, because my mom knew Wally, I was able to get in at, in the urban arts program and I was able to go to the children's theater school. Okay. Uh, when I was in eighth and ninth and 10th grade, I would, I would leave school every day at, at uh, 1230 and go down and have classes in the afternoon at the uh, children's theater of Minneapolis. Wow, that's a good opportunity. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was. I learned a lot there. They they um, 
they were pretty unique in you uh, using um, young people for the uh, uh, in the creative part of the process of creating theater. Mm -hmm. So it was um, it was a uh, very very good opportunity for me. Um, unfortunately, there was other things going on too. There, uh, the you may have heard of the sexual abuse and so on uh, with the um, director John Donahue uh, okay. was later, um, you know, uh, was later uh, arrested and so on. And uh, so I actually I was um, I was a part of uh, of a lawsuit just recently that re mm -hmm. recently concluded with Jeff Anderson. And uh, we, I was a part of 17, no, one of 17 um, people that sued Children's Theater and um, received a judgment uh, uh, because of the sexual abuse that, uh, that we re, that we uh, under, that happened to us while, mm -hmm. while we were there, so. I'm sorry to hear that. That's, uh, it's, it's been something that I've kind of put uh, on deny, put uh, been in denial about for years and years, because I wanted to say, you know, as a man, especially these kind of things that you want to say it doesn't affect you, uh, you know, but it but it does affect you in all kinds of uh, hidden ways, and uh, and so I I feel like you know with therapy and everything, I'm finally coming to some some healing and some understanding about that, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was, that was part of my background there. And I, I, you know, and I, I got to say that being a native was, was, I think a part of my being there. I mm -hmm. think they let me in, in part because, you know, I did, I could sing and act and dance and all that stuff too. But, you know, I think, uh, being native, you're uh, in this uh, pretty much white world that I grew up in here in Crystal. Right. You know, you're seen as kind of a curiosity. You know, right. you're seen as something exotic, and and uh, and you know, you you talk about microaggressions that you mm -hmm. um, that you notice in the Anoka Hennepin School District. And uh, before we started recording, you mentioned that, but. You know, we didn't call them that in our day, but it was, you know, we learned to uh, to ignore or to uh, make fun of mm -hmm. those kinds of things that people would say that you were native, and, you know, uh, just really to them innocent things like uh, like the old term Indian giver or, you know, I remember one time when I was a kid and we lived in Renville. We had had a birthday party and they were bringing us home in the car and we were rambunctious six-year-olds in the back seat. And the mom was like, as like, uh, settle down back there. Are you acting like a bunch of wild Indians? And uh, I kind of looked at her with my innocent little six-year-old face and said, I'm an Indian. And oh boy, did she feel bad about it. <laughs> I, mean, I can really... imagine too, growing up in Southern Minnesota. <laughs> It's also just a complicated landscape because of the history. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that that's the kind of it was it was something it was never anything like I felt I was being excluded or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I sometimes I felt looked down upon or made fun of. Or, but, you know, and I, I guess, guess I could give just as well as I got. So <laughs> I always figured it came out in the wash. So. So you went to Cooper for the most part, and then your children, did they go to Cooper as well? By then I had, um, I had uh, started teaching for some private schools. And so I took them to school with me. Okay. Uh, in the nineties, I worked at St. Paul Academy. And so uh, my first three kids uh, had part of their education, at least their elementary school education uh, in St. Paul. And they would ride with me every day. In 2001, I was part of starting a, a brand new Catholic school in Plymouth here in the western suburbs, Providence Academy. Okay. And, I, uh, and so the uh, oldest, my oldest child, Rachel, finished at St. Paul Academy in 2004, uh, but the rest of my kids uh, finished at Providence Academy. 
uh, at least the, the, the next four kids finish there. And uh, so I was there until 2017. And so, no, they didn't, they didn't go to public school except my youngest, Benjamin. Uh, he went there for mm, three or four weeks uh, before he just kind of dropped out. He, uh, he had a diagnosis of uh, Asperger's syndrome or he's diagnosed on this autism spectrum. And so um, he was kind of unschooled. He, uh, he couldn't really sleep at night when everybody else slept. He still to this day at age 20, he keeps, um, he's very much uh, has a different sleep cycle than everybody else. Uh, so we had, to, we had to take him out and he did, but he, we tried sending him to Cooper for four weeks or so. <laughs> That's the only one of, of my kids, of my six kids that went to Cooper. So the kids all went to private schools that were religious based? No, St. Paul Academy was not religious based. Okay. Uh, it was named after the city rather than the saint. It's a hundred year old private school and very, it's very much for the, uh, uh, for the brainy kids. The, okay. Uh, it's considered to be academically very challenging. And um, the, uh, I guess F. Scott Fitzgerald went to oh. St. Paul Academy. It's that old. It's, wow. it's more than a hundred years old. Uh, but it was like a day school, you know, in the early part of the 20th centuries. Um, uh, and it was kind of out in the country <laughs> in those days for St. Paul. But, you know, now it's right there in the urban city. It's right next to St. Kate's uh, College there on Randolph Avenue. Oh, I don't even think I knew it was there. Um, my husband and I, before living in Crystal, we lived in Highland Park. We rented ah. an apartment. Yes, so indeed. I feel like I went past St. Kate's every day, but I don't think I knew St. Paul Academy was tucked in over there as well. That's right. It's right on the. It was right on the other side of the hardware store that was on the corner there. Okay. And it's down towards Snelling a little bit more, right by yeah. uh, Carboni's. Oh yeah, man, yeah. I miss that neighborhood. That good pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife went to St. Kate's, so she lived in that neighborhood for a while too. Okay. So in their education experiences, did they ever have any native education programming? Uh, no, they, um, at, at St. Paul Academy, um, they weren't, yeah, no, the answer is no, they didn't have any uh, either at St. Paul Academy or Providence Academy. Uh, as a matter of fact, they, because I'm, because I'm slightly less than half uh, Winnebago, uh, they are not tribal members. Okay. Be twenty five percent or greater to to be automatic tribal members, and it's you know uh, unfortunately they were born in the time when all kinds of people are trying to become tribal members to get casino benefits, and mm -hmm. you know I was never interested in that, um, uh, but I didn't want to also be perceived as you know, trying to get them in for that reason. Right. So I, I never really tried it that hard to um, petition to have them become tribal members. So right. And they know who they are. They do. Mm -hmm. They uh, they have Indian names and they, you know, um, they know who they are. Like you said, perfect choice of words. Yeah, those got to love those colonial legacies of things like blood quantum. Blood quantum. Yeah. You love it and you hate it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so growing up and now living in, in Crystal, did you know or do you know now any other Native families in your area? So um, we had uh, a famous Ojibwe artist that lived in our neighborhood. Um, I forget his name right now, but if I showed you his paintings, you'd you'd know he, he, he has a famous painting of the hoop dancer and um, why can't I remember his name? It, it's gone out, maybe Brad will remember, but, but other than that, not, no, I don't remember a lot of native families in, in our neighborhood or are growing up near around us. Uh, and anybody that we met that was native, they usually weren't Winnebago, they were Ojibwe or they were, or they were uh, Lakota or Dakota. Yep. Uh, 
So most of our, most of the uh, natives that we knew were either relatives or friends of our family, uh, mm -hmm. but most of them didn't live in our area. So, so most of your family kind of lived outside of the Crystal area. Um, did they live in the Twin Cities at all, or even out out of the state? My um, my native relatives, most of them lived in uh, in Winnebago. Um, and uh, later on, once uh, as an adult, uh, some of them, um, my cousin Heather had a kid that lived with my brother for a while, Brad. And uh, other than that, uh, you know, they we had some relatives that sometimes lived in the Minneapolis area. It seems like they would uh, frequently go back and forth. Uh, between the Twin Cities and the reservation mm -hmm. down in Nebraska. Uh, you know, you get a job for a while and you make some money and then you miss home. And so you quit and you go back and live home, live off the money you made. And, and then after a while, there, you know, you run out of money. There's not that many opportunities in, in Winnebago. And so back on the road. Yeah. Come find a place apartment in Minneapolis or whatever so that was kind of the the story lots of movement back and forth yes indeed so you also mentioned when your family came to Crystal in 1970 your parents were able to purchase a home and you and your wife now are homeowners so how has that do you think that was kind of like a motivating factor for coming to this area was the ability to access home ownership oh yes Oh, definitely. I think um, that has provided a lot of stability, and my that's something my mom uh, pretty much insisted on uh, if we if we could afford it because they had lived a lot of different places, and this was our this is our first chance to you know I, I have home ownership, and um, uh, with with my dad's kind of really good stable job is a good union job there at. Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, ironically, I think the first year there, there was the year of the big strike, though. So there's a there's a picture of my dad in a, in a cowboy hat in the uh, in the old Union uh, newspaper, you know, holding the picket sign, and you know that was they loved that picture. <laughs> but um, then when it came time for me to buy a house. Um, uh, I was also a teacher in Minneapolis Public Schools. I taught at Anderson Open School, and I believe it was 1986 was my first year, and I taught there for six years, and we bought this house in 1988, um, and the way we got it was there was a program for first-time Indian home buyers that I found out about, and uh, so there was loans that were designated for Minneapolis, for St. Paul, for the suburban areas, and then for Duluth. And so I put my name in and uh, they had a lottery and we were like last in the lottery. <laughs> so I, you I just thought, you got well, it. <laughs> we tried, we tried, you know, we didn't get it. Uh, we were, because we were chosen last, but, um, it was coming to a close this is the end of 1988 and they called us in late october and said um there's a there's loans in in uh duluth that nobody wanted so there's extra loans that we'd like to offer you one for wherever you want to live and so we quickly found this house uh i think it just took us a week or two to find this house and and um Boy, did they string us along all through November. Um, we were getting ready to move. The closing was scheduled for December, but they wouldn't let us know and they wouldn't let us know. And they were checking and rechecking. And boy, I, they seemed really reluctant to take a chance on me, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of a nail biter, but in the end, they, you know, about six days before closing, they finally told us, okay, well, you got the loan. And, and it was... In those days, it was a 6% loan that was like unheard of. It was so low and it was 
contract for deed and and this kind of thing. And boy, the homeowners were really biting their nails too. They <laughs> they wanted to sell and they had already moved to Alexandria, I think, and they were retired. So uh so yeah, the 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 ability to own a home here and and to um raise our kids here. Uh there's lots of good parks around. It's a mm -hmm. quiet neighborhood with lots of trees, very tall trees that you know they they planted this neighborhood in the 1950s. Our house was built in the 1950s. Um, it's a rambler, and you know we have a we have a, a 90 foot um, uh, cottonwood tree that I'm looking at out the window over here, and it's it has a has a lot of stories to tell. I'm sure it was here when they mm -hmm. uh, when they built the house. So. But uh, a lot of maple trees and most of the elms got cut down in the 1970s, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Dutch elm disease, but but yeah, it's it's uh, it's been a it's been a good place. So. So the first time homebuyers um, program that you mentioned was that a HUD program? I think it was. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Okay. I feel like I need to go back and check in with my parents because when we moved to Coon Rapids, we had previously been renters, um, but my parents were able to buy a house. So I should double check and see if, what program that was. Cause I know it was like an Indian housing program, but I guess I never pro yeah. to figure out um, more specifically, what was it? The year was 1988. <laughs> yeah. And I think that was right around when we were bought our house. My parents bought our house in Coon Rapids too. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I started, yeah, started kindergarten in Coon Rapids around then. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> At the public schools, that. though. <laughs> sure. Oh, no. Yeah. I get it. Um, so, living in Crystal, you're in the Bassett Creek watershed area. Have you ever thought about the Dakota history of this geography? As a matter of fact, I've thought a lot about it. Um, I, uh, my friend Jim Rock, uh, who was a science teacher uh, in the Wyzetta district, uh, we met at a uh, science math conference uh, in the 90s. And uh, we started working together uh, teaching uh, Indian students at the University of Minnesota during the summertime. We had a uh, Indian math and science camp and uh, part of our, as part of our camp, I actually started working at the camp a couple of years before Jim, be before I found Jim. And uh, he, uh, he, he injected a lot more uh, Dakota knowledge and uh, place knowledge I didn't have as a Ho-Chunk. Uh, he uh, showed me this book by Paul Durand, Where the Waters Gather and the Rivers Meet, and that famous, um, that famous uh, map that uh, has all the native place names. I think I found a little yeah. copy of it there. You can see Haha -ha Wapadan on there. Uh-huh. And uh, so he showed me that, and we used we developed a um, sacred sites tour, and we we we'd have we had native kids from all over the country take this uh, Indian math and science camp at the University of Minnesota. Um, we, we it was run under uh, the auspices of ACES, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, um, but you know we we wanted to show kids. Uh, the sacred sites of this area. So we would take them to see the Red Rock down in uh, Newport, Minnesota. And we would go to uh, uh, Wakanti P, which is now, you know, the, the Vento Park, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't, it was really nothing to see then, but we could tell the kids, you know, this used to be a huge cave and then it was blown up and they had cave paintings and, you know, we tell the stories and then we end up at, at, uh, and we do a few other 
areas. We we take them downtown Minneapolis and St. Anthony Falls, and uh, we'd ask them to imagine what it was like, you know, before uh, when the falls were in a different place, and and uh, and what happened, and why does it look like this today? And and then we bring them to uh, we end up at Minnehaha Creek at the end, and just had a nice picnic there and so it was always a good day and we we always you know laid tobacco with the kids uh at each of the sacred sites and uh asked them to you know remember their relatives and remember our relatives oh i almost forgot mounds park where jim grew up uh, uh the indian mounds park in uh, in saint paul mm -hmm. that overlooks wakan tp and um uh, we'd sing and we would, uh, you know, even though it was a public, uh, public school, we, uh, we'd pray with the kids, you know, like that. So we natives can get away with that kind of stuff. Uh, and other people can't. <laughs> Rightly so. <laughs> um, so was this program, did the students, did they stay at the, um, the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota for a few days? That's where it started. It started on the St. Paul campus and they stayed in Bailey. Um, uh, after a while, it moved uh, over to the Minneapolis campus. And yeah, the, the last years of the program were in Minneapolis then. So they stayed, they stayed there too. I feel like my sister maybe did this. Oh, really? <laughs> because I remember her going to like a summer program at the University of Minnesota when she was still in high school. Um, yep. She stayed on the St. Paul campus for a few days, and I think it was like an ACES program. But yep, by the time I, I would have been old enough, I don't think it was still going on. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I feel like I'm the program. smarter one of the two as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, it was it was a lot of we we did a lot of um, sort of pre-college grooming for, you know, getting kids thinking about, you know, living in the dorms and, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are going to college, right? And so the math and the science, you, you really have to pay attention. And so we gave them some uh, native connections mm -hmm. to math and science. Uh, Jim would talk about uh, thinking Incan and applying Mayan. And we had, there was a lot of, uh, <laughs> uh mathematical patterns that we found in kipu uh this knotted strings from from the incan culture to show them we had you know the the uh with computers you work with uh strings of bits but the incans had bits of string they and they kept you know there was a it was also a a binary uh system of keeping information it was a knot or no knot, ones or zeros. And so it would show that the same ideas, science is something that's not white. It's not just European. Mm -hmm. It's a science and math. There's a, there's a worldwide phenomenon and everybody contributes equally. And, and so that's the way we tried to get them to look at math and science. So. Yeah, I think that's so important, even being, you know, here at the University of Wisconsin, I think about Native students who are in the STEM fields and just how few Native mentors or professors that they have access to and what a difference that would make for a lot of students to have that kind of Indigenous knowledge um, being much more prevalent for everybody, not just Native students, but all students in those fields. Yeah. So kind of on the flip side of that question, have you ever thought about your identity as a Native person living in a predominantly white suburb? Um, well, yeah, I think about it all the time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds about identity. We talk about identity a lot these days, and there's even identity politics that that go on and uh you know and so i i um i i'm a i'm i'm a strong i'm a strong catholic 
uh, I had a pretty profound, profound conversion experience after I left the children's theater. I was, I was looking for meaning in my life because of the abuse that I had suffered there. And, and so I, I had a very profound, uh, uh, encounter. I, I, uh, I'll put it that way with Christianity, with, with the, the person of Jesus. And then, um, you know, it was, you know, and I, since I didn't have, uh, I didn't grow up on the res or, or, uh, you know, in the, uh, I guess in close proximity to, to my, my, uh, native culture, yet there was kind of the quality of a vision quest at my, at my, at that tender age of 16, where I, you know, uh, spent hours in my room, just reading the Bible and, and trying to, uh, come in contact with uh with the um mauna with the creator you know uh in that way um uh, because my my dad had left and uh you know i was trying to make my own way in the world like that so so i uh the friends around me at cooper would would uh help me out and and they were they befriended me and and uh so i fell in with the evangelicals and then i met this girl and she was catholic and so i started trying to find out about the catholic religion too and so end up ended up marrying her and joining the catholic church and and uh and i've been you know through all the the um scandals and everything that have happened to the church in the last 20 years you know uh i've i've kind of kept to that uh, that original vision of uh it's about the person of jesus you know and it's about the the charity and the the uh, a love that uh that he brought to the world and that he uh that you know basically made uh, a lot of the wonders we have in the western world uh, possible um you know there i know there's a lot of baggage along with that too that uh a, a lot of bad treatment of uh of native people you know on behalf of people in the who thought they were doing good things you know mm -hmm. and uh but uh I, my dad was always about um reconciliation you know he he knew when it was time to be angry and when it was time to, to spout off you know about injustices but he also always told me that i had an answer in my genes from both sides of the world and that um and that we can't just um continue to foment injustice you know it doesn't it doesn't uh it doesn't make injustice better to um pile more injustice on top of it or to mm -hmm. pile more crimes or hate or you know any of those things and so uh it's not i know it's probably not a real popular thing to talk about nowadays about reconciliation and about um you know let's get along and work together and that, you know it's that's this is not the season for that message it seems uh and so i feel kind of like a relic in a way, my dad taught me this 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 way of reconciliation, and you know that Christianity and the and the native way of seeing things are not incompatible. Mm -hmm. They uh, there there's many intersections and places where you can cooperate and and uh, and make progress and learn together and bring bring peace and and good living, you know. So that's that's what I think about that uh, being an Indian in a predominantly white uh, society. Mm -hmm. So you weren't you weren't um, growing up when you were younger. You weren't raised Catholic. No, no, uh, -uh. we were uh, Lutheran. Uh, my mom was German Norwegian from uh, Albert Lee, like I said, and mm -hmm. so we we always went to the Lutheran church. Well, when my parents split up in 1972, you know, she felt 
she felt a little stared at, a little judged, uh, you know, and somebody probably said something that wasn't too charitable to her. And so we stopped going to church at that mm-hmm. point. And, you know, but there was, uh, like I said, I fell in with the uh, evangelicals in high school and, and they, they kind of took me in. So mm-hmm. they, they, uh, they just, loved me for who I was and they they didn't really care if I was white or Indian or whatever you know they just wanted to share the love of Jesus with me so I feel like for you I'm thinking about being native in a predominantly white environment you've also had to then think through um the role of religion and identity as well very much so um, and probably something brother, that you continue to think about, like being native, um, being Catholic, being so heavily involved, um, and teaching at a faith-based school as well. Yeah. I very much think about it. Uh, and the other aspect of that is my brothers are very much involved in the Native American church. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they have become kind of leaders and they sometimes invite me to participate and um you know i i i'm not i don't consider myself to have that as my primary religious commitment Mm -hmm. but i but like i said my dad eyes told us there's um there's an answer in my genes from both sides in Mm -hmm. the world so uh on the other hand in the catholic church i've gravitated to the most traditional uh kind of expression of that faith which is the latin mass i've become because of my work in music i went to saint olaf was a music major as well as a math teacher and uh i've become an expert in gregorian chant and um teach uh teach and lead several groups in the twin cities um singing Mm -hmm. uh, latin gregorian chant at um both traditional mass and and the newer mass as well. So uh, it's kind of like if you're native, you seek out the most traditional. Mm-hmm. You know, you look you you look at the ancestors, and you're taught to value what they say and to emulate them. And you know, it's kind of in our DNA. That's how we were able to be able to survive because we listened to to our to our elders Mm -hmm. and honored them by uh, doing what they do and saying what they say. It's, I think it's so interesting too, in thinking about the role of boarding schools and Christianity um, in American Indian communities and assimilation and how there's today so many native people who might be devout Catholic, for example, but still so culturally involved in aware um, and ceremonial practices too. I think just religion, broadly speaking, um, it's so important for Native people, regardless of what that affiliation is. Yeah. I think my mother-in-law also likes going to Latin Mass. Oh, really? (laughs) My husband, uh, so my mother-in-law and my husband, they're Lebanese. Ah. Um, She sometimes goes to like the Lebanese churches in South St. Paul as well. Wow. So I think some of those services are done in Arabic even. Yes, the Maronite, Maronite. Right. Yeah. yeah, is right down there by All Saints where I, that that's my full-time Sunday gig is, is the, uh, the All Saints, the FSSP's Fraternity of St. Peter. It's just two blocks from the Maronite church. Okay. You know, we got the that beautiful Ukrainian church right in between the two as well, so. so. So on Sundays, you um, go to mass, not necessarily at Epiphany. Right. Okay. I don't. No, I go, I go down to uh, All Saints. They do the, exclusively the Latin mass at that parish now since uh, 2013. Okay. I'll have to ask if she goes there or any family members, because though my husband and mother-in-law are from Coon Rapids, all the rest of the family is in kind of the South St. Paul area. Oh, South St. Paul. Yes, South St. Paul, that's the other Latin Mass center. Say they have St. Augustine's and I think it's Holy Trinity. Mm-hmm. That's 
probably where uh, it, yeah, I, we've had this pastor here at St. Raphael's, uh, all, Father Altier, and he got moved to South St. Paul, so that he's doing the Latin Mass there. I never thought I'd be so um, learning so much about churches through this project, <laughs> but you know, the the this the Valley Community Presbyterian Church is obviously Presbyterian, so I've been yes. learning about the Presbytery. Um, mm. One of the other participants in this oral history project is a gentleman named Grant Tubles, and okay. his dad is the Reverend Robert Tubles, who's it one of the Indian mission churches in Minneapolis. Okay. So he was kind of explaining to me um, about the Episcopalian church. He went to Breck in uh, Golden Valley, which yes. is an Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. I'm like learning all this religious history through this project as a person that does not identify as Christian. Mm -hmm. So, but yes. it is it is interesting to see native people going to these different um, religious denominations, regardless of what it is. Um, one of the other folks I interviewed for this project is a woman named Diane Wilson. She's Dakota, hmm. um, and she's an author, a pretty well known author in the Twin Cities. And her family actually attended um, Valley Community Presbyterian Church. Oh, up until the time, I believe they were confirmed. And then her parents are kind of like, you know, you're old enough to make your own decisions about if you want to attend the church or not. And her and her siblings opted not to. But yeah. So in thinking about, again, kind of growing up in this, this region in the Bassett Creek region, um, growing up, were you involved in any cultural activities? Um, is that something you went to Minneapolis for where there's the larger urban Indian community? Or did you travel back to your home reservation for cultural activities, um, either growing up again in this area or as an adult raising your own children? So as a child, when, uh, when my dad was with our family, we would make regular trips to not just the Winnebago powwow, which happens in late July, uh, but you know, a few summers we we traveled around and kind of did the powwow circuit. And mm -hmm. you know, my brothers, I think my oldest brother was involved in a few uh, dance contests and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I remember going to um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa. Um, Wisconsin, uh, as well as Shakopee had a big powwow when I was growing up. And uh, so, yeah, I would, I would, we all had uh, regalia that we would um, curate and, um, and uh, take care of. And we each had our own little suitcase and, uh, but then after he left, that became something that was left that was um harder to make happen you know mm -hmm. uh my mom as a single mom um you know she understood the importance of our culture and language and everything but as a single mom she could only do so much right. you know and my dad would you know show up once in a while and take us places and we'd see him at powwows and if we you know had the wherewithal to uh to, to get there and make it happen. Um, then after college and after marriage and we were raising our own kids, um, by then my dad had um, kind of accepted the fact that he was an elder. <laughs> it took him a while, it took him a long time. Uh, somebody growing up in the 60s and uh, you know, he held on to his youth for a long time, you know, <laughs> uh, past its sell by date, I think, but eventually. I have a good <laughs> mental image of your dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And so, but eventually, you know, he would make sure to, uh, to get us uh, in the Native American church and make sure our kids had uh, Indian names and, um, and that uh, 
So we, uh, we're always a part of that and we try to make it to powwow at least every other year. Um, and so my kids are familiar, all but my youngest. My youngest doesn't have an Indian name and uh, he was only three when my, when my dad died. So mm -hmm. we didn't get a chance to get uh, Benjamin an Indian name. Uh, he's my youngest son. Uh, I feel like he should just take my, my name since he has my English name too. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, they, uh, but because they're not tribal members, mm. you know, uh, some of, uh, they, they don't feel, I don't think the same connection to the place, to the, to the people, to the culture that I did growing up. And, you know, I somewhat regret that my, uh, but, but some of them have shown some interest. My son, Joseph at the, um, who's in his third year at the University of Minnesota, oh, is going to finish next year, I think. He, uh, he took Dakota uh, because he was interested in the culture and, and that they was being offered and he needed a language credit. So I think he took it for a couple of years and they told him he could have switched to Ho-Chanka, but, uh, and, it, and it, cause it was online anyways, but, uh, but ultimately he missed the deadline. And, and so he stuck with Dakota. So he, um, so there's there's some interest there. Um, and a great uh, place. But, it's a great place to learn Dakota at the University of Minnesota. Yes, Those great instructors. But I was going to mention we teach Ho Chunk here at the University of Wisconsin too, yes. and I think it's online. Yes. Yeah. I think he was offered that that opportunity, and I not know with deadlines. <laughs> yeah, I know when we teach. So the University of Wisconsin also offers Dakota, but it's through the University of Minnesota. Yes. So there's like some really great like language consortium, which is really yep. nice when you think about how few native language speakers there are and that these really aren't high enrolling classes. So it makes sense to kind of share our resources. Yeah. Great. I love it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to mention this now because I was thinking about it before when you were talking about the Catholic Church, but I forgot to mention it previously. A, a good friend and colleague that I have, she's Dakota and grew up in kind of Minnetonka, Plymouth. She's now an assistant professor over at Marquette in Milwaukee. Mm. And when she took the job there, her research is really on literature, Native American literature. But when she took the job there, they kind of like opened Pandora's box and were like, well, we have all these boarding school and church records. Um, so she's kind of making her way through that just to really see what they even have, because they have so many records of Catholic churches, not only across the United States, but into Canada as well. So there's lots, lots to be thought of. Um, and the religion and kind of what are the responsibilities now? Yeah. Yes. Um, that's a, yeah, that's a, uh, a topic that, um, some of the people that are kind of jumping on this bandwagon talking about native schools are, um, you know, they do it for a reason. I think there's a political reason for it, right? Why it's coming out now. And, mm -hmm. and um, but I think the more they, they look into it, they'll maybe find some things they didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Like like some of those schools may have done some good. Right. And some of the some of the parents might have actually wanted their kids right. to learn a trade in those schools. Right, right. I know um, <laughs> like Brenda Child, who's at the University of Minnesota, wrote about boarding schools in her book. And it wasn't always negative. It wasn't always this horrible. No. Um, situation some parents and families elected to send their children and for a lot of children it was a good experience um, children had a place to live they were fed they were clothed so it really is much more complex um, than just saying it was all negative for everyone yeah um, coming back to these questions and thinking about language, which is what we are leaving off on with yeah. our son learning Dakota. So Haha Wakfadan is the Dakota name for Bassett Creek. 
what do you think about the role and importance of language and place names, particularly in um, predominantly white settler spaces? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of divided about it um, since we, uh, you know, still refer to uh, that nice lake down in Minneapolis by the uh, uh, by the slaveholder's name, <laughs> Calhoun, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we still talk I'm, um, uh, about that in that way. And so it's, uh, you know, but maybe my, my grandchildren won't remember that name mm -hmm. anymore. And that's just fine with me. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think uh, it's, it's very difficult for, um, I guess in European Americans to pronounce the native languages. And so Wazieta becomes Wazeta. And you know, which I guess is natural and I that's okay. Uh you know, Bidote becomes Mendota and you know, so uh I I I I, I tend to avoid conversations about it because I know what I think about it uh but I, what I think about it is complex it's like the boarding mm -hmm. school issue it's a complex thing I I do like seeing uh the original names used you know uh, uh because it it causes people to think differently about right. the place and about about the people that and about what the history of the of the land is like. Um, at the same time, I don't I I don't like when people use it for evil. Mm -hmm. You know, when they use use it to say that white people are evil and you know that they're that they're worthless and they you know <laughs> I, I I don't like that. I like reconciliation. I like people to get along. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I'm kind of a relic that way, but <laughs> it's not the way people think today. Uh, but I hope that someday it might be again. A young looking relic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I think you make a good point too, though. Just because the name of Bede Makaska has changed doesn't mean that people are all going to adopt it and start calling it the Dakota name, the kind of legal yep. name either. It might take generations to get to that point as well. I mean, the, when you hear a native person say it, it's a beautiful name. Mm -hmm. But when it turns into Bidet McCaska, mm -hmm. then I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I like that so much. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, right? When it's not done well or correctly no. and intentionally yeah. so. Yeah. So another question is to think about um, the land acknowledgement statements. So this oral history project grew out of a land acknowledgement statement by Valley Community Presbyterian Church. Um, what do you think about land acknowledgement statements broadly? And then once a land acknowledgement statement has been done, what do you see as necessary and supplemental follow-up work? So there's a part of me that, uh, is brought to tears by something like that because it just feels like um, somebody's acknowledging something that's been a part of my life, a part of my family's life for generations and centuries. And finally they're looking at it in a, in a way that is honoring and in a way that is humble and in a way that is human. And it, it kind of brings me brings me tears like that. And I'm grateful, grateful for that. Um, on the other hand, I see um, uh, some people that uh, have uh, just so much guilt. They feel so much guilt about their privilege and their, um, uh, the, uh, the success of their culture and and peoples and the, the riches they have and you know and I I I guess that uh, 
it's it's on the one hand uh if they're doing it in the spirit that brings me to tears that 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 i think is a good healthy thing for everybody for all of us um if it if it's uh on the other hand some kind of uh way to assuage guilt i didn't number one they they didn't do it they personally didn't mm-hmm. you know do the atrocities that uh they're not personally responsible and and i hate to have them carry that you know personally mm-hmm. when it doesn't belong to them personally you know if yes it, it does belong to them uh, as part of their heritage and it's it's not a great heritage that's not a great part of their of their great heritage you know Mm -hmm. everybody's heritage has shadows and and Mm -hmm. uh things that uh that they're not proud of their ancestors for including native peoples Mm -hmm. Uh, and so uh i don't i don't like to see that take uh take away their you know they're um being proud of their own of their own heritage and uh the, the, i don't think it should you know be the primary thing that their ancestors are remembered for mm-hmm. i think they their their ancestors can be honored in in uh in other ways that you know that still acknowledge the injustice and the uh, and the uh the evil that was done you know and and we I think our our um in looking at the past you we should always look keep in mind that we're looking at the horizon we're always looking up at the horizon for what's for what's coming next and how can we avoid uh these kinds of injustices in the future that's where our focus should be what can we learn mm-hmm. and, and how can we change the the way we act we can never go back and change what happened already but we can change the choices we have in the future and hearing you say that um it makes me really think about land acknowledgements need to be done for the right reason because somebody or an organization wants to do it not because they feel like they're forced into it because of this um because of feelings of guilt or wrongdoing yep yeah. Um, thinking more specifically about the actual Bassett Creek watershed and the surrounding area today. So we know that this was a Dakota place and the Dakota homelands, but it's also a very um, suburban and highly developed area today. So if there was an opportunity to give advice for those who help steward and manage the Bassett Creek watershed, are there any particular changes or initiatives that you would like to see? Wow, that's a big, that's a big question. I, I haven't thought about that very much at all, and I'm not sure I have much to, to offer in that way. Um, you know, I there's a, there's a Bassett Creek Park where uh, um, my kids and and my brothers have all run cross country races in that park and so it's well known to us and we look at it as a place where you know we uh we have memories good memories of running hard races you know Mm -hmm. and that in that place and i brought my kids there to play a lot um uh, so you know maybe maybe something interpretive um might that might be appropriate Mm-hmm. to go there to to acknowledge uh the uh the original name of the spot i i don't think that could hurt at all i think that's uh that would be a, a nice addition mm-hmm. to uh to what's there and it wouldn't i don't think i think it would ha- enhance the uh the beauty of the of the spot to know to have people think about you know, what did this look like before Highway 100 was, you know, mm-hmm. built through here and before the lilac bushes were all planted on Lilac Way, you know, did they did they grow here naturally too? 
you know, that, that, that might be an interesting thing to find out. Yeah, you know, I think this the Valley Community Presbyterian Church is located on Lilac Drive. <laughs> yep, exactly right. Yep. Um, and speaking with Jim Rock and his wife, Roxanne, for this project, I feel like I've learned so much from them about the environmental aspect and status of, of the watershed. They're very knowledgeable. Mm. Much more than I, and I've learned and a lot. Much more than me. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Not much more than me. Is there anything else that you would like to share with future generations um, of folks about your experience as a Native person in a predominantly white suburb, or anything else that we may have missed today during our conversation? Um, just that I've, in, in working in my yard, I, I think a lot about uh, this area, uh, when I'm in contact with the soil, and you know, I uh, I like to say that I listen to the trees. You know, I'm, I'm being all kind of mystical like that, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's some pretty old trees in my backyard, and they provide a lot of shade, and and they're also a big nuisance. That cottonwood is horrible when it in the spring when it releases the cotton and the seeds are sticky and get all over the deck and, and you know <laughs> sometimes I just want to cut it down but but it's uh it's difficult and I and I you know I I just uh when I dig out in the ground I I always wonder if I'll find something from you know native native populations yeah. but so far just things from the 1950s <laughs> that's all I that's all I found but uh no I, I mean I don't have any um profound thoughts about that right now so I know I think that's a good point though is you know when you live in an area where you know there were native people um you never know what you're gonna find um, yeah while you, whether you're looking for it with intention or just by working out in your yard yeah well, that concludes our official interview. So I am going to stop the um, recording, but thank you so much, Ben, for sharing your time with us today. Thank you for listening. This project may serve as a model for other communities that seek to go beyond land acknowledgement. To learn more about this oral history project, please contact Hennepin History Museum. The project was produced following the standards and principles of the Oral History Association. In addition to this podcast, the interview recordings, transcripts, and narrator files included signed legal released agreements can be found at the Hennepin History Museum. Funding and other support was provided by the St. Anthony's Falls Heritage Board, Hennepin History Museum, Valley Community Presbyterian Church, and the University of Wisconsin. This publication was also made possible in part by the people of Minnesota through a grant funded by an appropriation to the Minnesota Historical Society from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Any views, findings, opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this publication are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent those of the State of Minnesota, the Minnesota Historical Society, or the Minnesota Historic Resources Advisory Committee. Anaya Chopta Pecha Wopira Unkenichiapi. Thank you for listening.